So, hello everyone. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, good. So, Kino. So, you should all be seeing my screen now, hopefully. So, I thank you for the introduction and uh, thanks for letting me talk about the, uh, our machine learning topics at PSI. So, I know in the abstract I said I would only talk about the Bayesian optimization at Swissfell and HIPAA, but I actually got the, a bit of an overview also from about the other machine learning project at PSI. So for some of you who might not be so familiar with PSI, it's a Swiss uh, national research center, roughly located between Zurich and Basel, if you're not going on a straight line. And we have four accelerator facilities at PSI. Here you see an aerial view of it. So we have uh, the Swiss light source, our donut, the Swiss FEL, our most recent uh, free electron laser built in the middle of the forest on the other side of the area. Then we have a proton machine, ProScan, used for proton therapy, and our high intensity proton accelerators, HIPAA. And what is maybe a bit special about uh, is that we control everything from a central control room. There are typically three or four people. Um, to control all accelerators. Okay, now machine learning at PSI, what are we using it for? So I've grouped it in the, in the big uh, four topics that were, for example, at the machine learning workshop, the categories. So tuning, optimization, and control. There I will tell you about the Bayesian optimization, which we use at Swissfell and TIPA. Then for prognostics, alarm handling, or anom anomaly breakout detection, we have a, a topic of the interlock prediction at HIPAA, which I will show you a bit about. There are also some research going in into virtual diagnostics, where our photon diagnostics people are looking into it to basically predict the, the results of invasive measurements by looking a lot of data of non-invasive measurements. Then for data analysis, I'm not showing you any examples, but here basically our beamline people are looking into this. Then uh, for simulations and modeling, I will show you um, some recent results from surrogate models, which can be really nice tools when simulations are really time consuming or there's no clear model. So you can train a fast online model of an accelerator, for example. Then other projects going on at PSI that are not directly accelerator related. For example, they, they are looking into efficient patient scheduling for the proton therapy, or even how to efficiently pack uh, castor containers. So these are the containers that store nuclear waste. Okay, now a couple more <laughs> words about myself. So as you've heard from Andreas, I did my PhD at KIT. There I basically worked on um, electron diagnostics, which also led me in the sidetrack of uh, laser mass production. And up here you actually see a picture of me visiting a PSI during my PhD. Oh, I think it was a little bit later, sorry, but where they were just building up the Swissfell tunnel during the construction. Then when I went to PSI, I went there for the commissioning of Swissfell. But uh, when I came, it was still the aluminum foil, a tin foil age so the construct the installation was not completely done so i helped a bit with that to get going and then finally the commissioning and then the operation of swissfell so my background is not in machine learning so you might be wondering how did i get involved in this it's basically a collaboration that was started um, between the learning and adaptive systems group of Professor Andreas Krause at the ETH. So Rasmus, who is also in the audience, initiated that. And this was the idea to get machine learning know-how to PSI, because we're not the machine learning experts here. And at the ETH said they have a really strong computer science department. And of course, they are looking into this a lot. So the first uh, topic that we wanted to work on was tuning of Swissfell, and it sounded like a pretty promising topic for collaboration. We have lots of data, we have a complex optimization problem, and it's pretty time consuming to do it manually. 
And so the collaboration started. Also here with the, mainly the, our main contact is the PhD student Johannes Kirschner in Andreas' group. And so what was our goal for the project? So the optimization of the FEL pulse intensity, because basically many photons means happy users at an FEL. The challenges are that uh, you have typically an exponential dependence of the FEL output on many, quite often coupled machine parameters and manual tuning can be really time consuming and also pretty inefficient when you have many knobs. Here I say many knobs 40, uh, nowadays a lot more knobs than that are touched, but um, we actually benchmarked once and even at five knobs, I was already considerably slower than any algorithm. Also a challenge is we don't really want to drive the machine into the wall. So here you see parts of the team. We have now also uh, Jochem and Jaime joining, who come from the proton machine, I'll tell you more about later. Okay, so our ML experts um, suggested that we use Bayesian optimization to tune the FEL. Now, how does this work? So with Bayesian optimization, and the idea is that you learn your objective function by doing evaluations and then you use Gaussian processes to model. So you basically would take an evaluation. So at this point where you evaluate, you know your function really well. And then you use Gaussian processes with the error bands here or the uncertainty bands to um, get a model of your function. Then you pick another evaluation. And now the idea is that you pick the next point to evaluate in a clever way. So you basically go to a point where you would expect, oh, the signal can be really high. Of course, it could also be pretty low. And so you keep building up your model. Now you can also add uh, safety constraints. For the example here, we're just showing that as a safety constraint is a really easy one. We're picking um, this red line here. So basically that our, the lower uncertainty bound of our um, objective function shouldn't be below this threshold. Marked below here in green, you see then basically the safe area where we think it's pretty safe to evaluate. So then you would go and pick another point. Ooh, this was a pretty much of a disappointment. And then you would pick more points here to find the optimum inside your safe set. Okay, now the first results we got at this with Swissfell. Um, what we did is we had to do a trade-off between expanding steps and exploitation steps because basically you want to make sure that you don't get stuck in a local optimum and basically expand your safe set as well. So what you see up, up here in the plots is basically the evolution of tuning two parameters through several steps. And the orange crosses are evaluations that we took specifically to expand our safe set boundaries, which is here marked in red dots. The whole background coloring you see is basically the, the model as it builds up. And the blue crosses are then the exploitation steps where we really want to find uh, the best optimum point. So here you see in the beginning, we did a bit of mix of both. Then here for some steps, we basically only did, um, did uh, ex um, expanding steps and then later on fully exploited to find the optimum signal. Okay, so now this was data for two parameters, but um, how does this actually scale for many parameters? So just plain Bayesian optimization scales pretty poorly. So we had to come up with um, a way of adding many knobs. And so basically what we're doing is we're doing a combination of a gradient method. So basically local sampling. And then we do the same Bayesian optimization, but with a line. So the idea is, so I'm showing the example here now again for two parameters because uh, everything else is gets uh, basically impossible to, to visualize. So the idea is we now have an underlying function that we don't know yet. We start somewhere, do a local sampling around this, 
to see if there are any gradients. And based on that, we pick a linear combination of our tuning parameters and then do a line optimization along this line with Bayesian optimization. Then we find the next optimum. And then from there, we do another gradient search and pick another line. We also experimented with random lines at the beginning, but if you keep adding more and more parameters, it's most efficient to, to uh, pick the lines in a smart way. And here we'll go on, go on, go on, maybe find an optimum here, and then finally get to, hopefully to a global optimum. So here I'm showing you a, a summary of the results that we got at SwissFell. So in the first plot, you see, so the x-axis is always the tuning steps. We, we're tuning roughly at about one hertz. Um, so 500 steps is about eight minutes. And here we benchmarked uh, different algorithms. So we started from a detuned machine. You see here the FEL pulse intensity and then did uh, different methods. And here the error bars you see correspond to different runs. So the first one we did was a parameter scan. There you basically scan every parameter after each other, go to the maximum and then go on. But then uh, the orange one is nail the meat. So it's also sometimes referred to as simplex, a classical gradient method. And then uh, the line Bayesian optimization, what I just told you about. And here this was all done for 24 parameters simultaneously. And here you see actually that um, in our case here, for this example, the Bayesian optimization actually outperformed the other ones. Typically, uh, gradient methods are also very efficient if you are not, don't have too many side optimums. Then we also experimented with uh, the safety constraints. So quite often we didn't put in safety constraints for tuning SwissFell because it actually turned out that it's not so easy to run into losses or really drive the beam into the wall while tuning. But um, what we found quite efficient is putting a lower bound on, on the expected FEL signal and call this the safe line BO. And this actually avoided the algorithm to go into locations where the signal could potentially be really high, but potentially could also be really low. And this actually um, sped up things and make them more robust as well. Then we also added more parameters and did a run with 40 parameters. And here you see after about a bit less than a thousand steps, we had a pretty good um, uh, signal already again. So this is quite uh, nice. So this method really scales more linearly with the optimization parameters and not the quadratic as for most optimizations. Okay, so here are a few words about the, the optimization tool that was developed in the scope of this project. So it's a server application that runs on a server. We have a client GUI going through a REST API and some data is also written into our control system just for live displaying. And then uh, Johannes added a lot of nice uh, algorithms, also extremum seeking and the melon meat simplex. And so this can be easily selected. So different algorithms can be compared with the same procedure. What is really nice about this uh, implementation of the Bayesian optimization is that we have very few hyperparameters, namely only the length scale. And this is really nice because sometimes with optimization, when you wanna use uh, smart optimizations, the problem shifts from optimizing your parameters to actually optimizing your hyperparameters, which can be really cumbersome, especially if you're not a machine learning expert. We also added a lot of machine related beam checks, for example, to see if the feedbacks are there and there's actually beam and so on. And now uh, Jaime, and Jochem added a lot of live plotting and analysis to actually get a nice live view if uh, things are going the way we want them to go. So now I told you we're not only uh, used this for SwissFell, but you also wanted to try this out for the Proton machine, HIPAA. And here you see actually a top view of the big ring cyclotron and you can already see it's a bit of a beast uh, with a very powerful proton beam. And this, machine does not uh, require tuning of the output signal, but uh, 
tuning of the losses to have them low enough that we can actually produce the high beam current. And this is typically done by hand by really experienced operators. And if the losses get too high in a specific location, the beam is turned off by an interlock system, which you'll hear a lot more about later because we want to predict also these interlocks. So we still want to keep the overall losses low and they are channel or they are basically in the control system we have available a special weighted sum of loss detectors in a region and this is actually our tuning signal. And now the question is whether safe Bayesian optimization can help here as well. So for this um, we actually don't, so we use the same kind of Bayesian optimization as before um, but we also want to model the safety function because it's more complex now because here you couldn't simply pick halfway of this signal but you take the signal of many loss detectors and as you go along you also build up a model of your constraint function then ideally your safe set increases and um, the big challenges is that usually when the machine is set up we are very close to the limit of interlocks on all these detectors. So it's pretty hard to only make safe steps. Our operators, when they are tuning, they might be a bit more bold here than uh, you want the algorithm to be. And also it's a big machine that is generally a, a rather slow response and a lot of hysteresis in the magnets and so on. So it's not easy per se to tune it not in a in a fast way. So here I'm showing you some data with the 10 knobs. We only touched quadrupoles for this and the green curve here you see is our um, objective function that we wanted to diminish. So this is this overall loss signal and the red one here is the constraint function. And if we just set it to really safe tuning, it basically wouldn't dare to move at all. So we had to find a a compromise to say, okay, you can be over the constraint function occasionally, um, but still rather conservative. And this actually worked pretty well. So we didn't cause any real beam interlocks um, while we were tuning. And within about 170 steps or so, we got back to the, to the optimum setting about to the same level as the, the operators would come. On the right, you actually see also uh, a plot of our objective function here, but here just one parameter was tuned and you see the, the safe set here, you see the evaluation points, how the model is building up and here actually at the dashed line we started and then here it found a better optimum and then it went on to the next, um, to the next knob to try. But we also use the gradient method as well. Okay, so where's here the, where does the journey go to with this uh, Bayesian optimization? So basically we have this versatile framework. We are just about uh, to finally bring it into a tool now that can be started and used by the operators by themselves. It can in general be used at, at other epics based accelerators. And we would also like now to move the algorithms into a Python package so it can be easily implemented in other optimization frameworks, for example, like Ocelot, which is in use at Daisy and Slack. And this is the, our midterm goal. So now I told you, so now we're basically swapping uh, topics because I also wanted uh, to tell you about the other projects at PSI. And now you already heard about the Proton machine. Here you actually see a sketch. So it's a bit more complex than just this beautiful ring cyclotron that you saw in the picture before. So it starts with a Cockroft Walton, then a cyclotron that we call the injector transport, then the ring cyclotron, then the proton ca canal, then the targets to generate the muons. Okay, and now this interlock system that shuts off this extremely 1.3 megawatt powerful beam reads data from a lot of sensors along there and then uh, decides when to turn off the beam. This accounts for about 20% of all beam losses and we believe that quite some of them could be avoided. There are many, many different types of interlocks 
but about five to six common, common types. So here on this project, uh, Sichen, who is also in the audience, is working as a PhD student, and I'm also showing some results of Melissa, who's also here, I think, uh, who did her master project on this. And the project, so Jaime, Davide, Jochem are also involved, and Andreas, of course. And um, it is also supported by the Swiss Data Science Center. So they um, give uh, advice and counseling on uh, as data scientists on what approaches to use. So, okay, looking a bit more about the, uh, into these interlocks. So every real beam interlock turns off the beam for about 25 seconds. Afterwards, the machine ramps up again slowly and so on. Here you see a uh, histogram of the interlocks over a certain period per day. And we basically have about 30 to 40 interlocks a day. And if you assume that some of them could be prevented by lowering the beam current for a few seconds before the interlock would happen, then uh, we could maybe prevent some interlocks. But in order to do so, we would have to predict that an interlock is going to happen soon. And now the question is, can we do this? So what would be your approach? <laughs> from this beautiful uh, XKCD comic uh, to go with it. So your field has been struggling with this problem for years. Struggle no more. I'm here to solve it with algorithms. And then about half a year later, wow, okay, this problem is hard. Ah, you don't say. Of course, this is something we have to always keep in mind. Uh, typically when we uh, want the help of machine learning, it's not a trivial problem. So many suggestions came up what to do. And I'll basically show you two approaches now. So one approach, so basically all the approaches are with neural networks. And the first approach, the master thesis of Melissa is based on classification. And then afterwards I show you what Sichin is currently working on where she does a time series analysis. Okay, so going to the classification approach. So the idea is to train a model with supervised learning that can predict interlocks and then on the next step even prevent them by lowering. So the approach is we take data from our archiver and here um, people suggested about 450 different data channels. So it's a lot of data. And now the idea is to find the best model and also figure out, for example, how early we could uh, predict these interlocks from happening. So is it rather a thing that ooh, we know five minutes before already ooh, an interlock might be building up? Or is it more of a, ooh, now, 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 and now you have to turn off right away. So the idea is here, you have an interlock. You need at least five seconds to react. So ideally at the latest five seconds before an interlock would happen, um, we would need to have a good prediction. And so to train the model with supervised learning, we need data from an interlock window and also data from stable windows. So Melissa's approach was after trying out some random forests, she went on to the idea of making use of all these image-based neural networks, for example, like a convolu convolutional neural net, CNN. But for this, you have to turn the time series data that you have from all of your, your um, archived data sensors into images. And for this, the idea is to use uh, recurrence plots. So recurrence plots are basically distance matrices that are then uh, cut off with an epsilon. And here, Wikipedia luckily has some uh, real world examples of um, what this would look like if you have different uh, time series data. And if you would turn them into a, a recurrence plot, this is what these matrices would look like that you would then feed into your neural network. So for example, if you have here something like this that is going up, you would see quite a distinct pattern. Okay, so now the uh, Melissa took all these timestamp uh, time data and created an image out of each of them. And 
here, of course, you can then cut them in half because they're symmetric and then feeding this into a CNN. And now what you have to know is that if a real interlock happens, we have 25 seconds of no beam. But there's also a penalty if we would detect the false positive. So if, if our um, prediction would say, okay, there's an interlock, then we lower the beam current and then there would be no interlock. So this would mean about six seconds, would correspond to about six seconds of no beam. So for comparison here now, you use these uh, rock curves where you basically drop, uh, plot the true positive rate over the false positive rate. And this dashed line here marks uh, the region where it would actually be good if we lowered the beam. So we need a, a decent true positive rate, but we want a really low false positive rate. So we don't unnecessarily turn the beam off. And so the first results here looked uh, really good and nearly a bit uh, too good to be true. And then uh, Melissa noticed, oh, okay, there was some timestamp pattern recognized and the algorithm learned that. Once this was then removed, um, which is now what is going on at the moment, things looked uh, not quite that good anymore, but still here in a range where um, we could actually gain something from it. So here's an example um, what you did with that. So this is an example from a training set, what uh, things could look like. And up here in orange, you see the real beam current. And here at this location, then an interlock would happen, bam, beam is off. And the blue is the prediction from the model saying, ooh, there could be an interlock, there could be an interlock coming. And then here in purple, you see a threshold that can be chosen where we want it. And here you see at uh, about five seconds before the interlock, uh, the prediction is very good already. And here, maybe at 10, 15 seconds, you start to be able to predict something. So this is also interesting. So for a lot of interlocks, it looks like uh, you cannot predict them five minutes in advance, which is something we would also expect, um, but actually only a few seconds before. But even these few seconds could be, um, could be helpful. Okay, so this is what uh, Melissa is and or was and still is uh, working on. And now let's swap to the approach what Sichim is working on at the moment. And here is basically the time series approach. And she's also using a neural network, but a long short term memory neural network, LTSM. So this is an artificial recurrent neural network that can be used directly for time series data. This for example is sometimes used for voice recognition. And here the idea is you have your time series data where several interlocks or interlocks happen in between and now you, you take um, sequences that can have random length before the interlocks. And then, so the input is this time series data. For example, here seven seconds before an interlock, six seconds before an interlock. And the goal is to get a live prediction of your yt. So this is the time to the actual interlock based on the input. And here Sichin has made, uh, so this is sorry, first a, a sketch, I'll show you the video afterwards. So this is first a, a sketch of how this neural network works. And down here you see your yt distribution on that gets then predicted. So it basically gives you as output these shape parameters of your distribution. And now comes uh, the video Sichin made. So for this video, I'll, I'll go going to run through it with you a couple of times um, so you understand it. So basically it's the last 30 seconds before an interlock. So when I start the video, you'll, you'll see the estimated probability distribution. 
in black as the time to the interlock gets shorter. So let me just show that here once. So the time gets shorter, now we're 20 seconds before the interlock and now the probability starts right still about now, it starts rising 5% and so on and you also see that the prediction here gets a lot higher. Bam here, we were at five seconds before. So let me just run that again and then I can stop it. So here basically 20 seconds before, you cannot really predict yet that an interlock is running, uh, is going to happen anytime soon. But here from 10 seconds on, it starts rising gradually. I'm going to stop it here. And then around the five second mark, um, the probability is in the order of 50% already and then going higher. Oh, sorry, I have to go back. Um, so this is not yet the, the final result or anything. This is just what Sikim is working on at the moment. And it's the result of the best performance sequence. And she's still looking at the overall performance, but it looks already very promising. Okay, now bear with me. We're doing another jump to another topic. So now we're, we're getting to the um, surrogate models. So the master thesis of Renato was called Accelerating Accelerators, Fast Surrogate Models for Beam Prediction. And here the idea is that, for example, you have um, your simulation code, for this example, Opal was used, that gives you very precise results, but the simulations are very time consuming. So the idea is to train, based on simulation data, a surrogate model with a neural network. And this, and this model is then a really fast model that can give you very accurate, uh, accurate predictions of uh, your beam parameters. And this was done for the example of the Argon Wakefield Accelerator AVA. It's basically a, let's say, a rather uh, simple machine for this model um, with a GAN, four Linux modules, several solenoids. And this was then simulated about 20,000 sets with OPAL. And 1K, 1,000 of these were used for the validation. And with this, the model was trained. So the input parameters of the model were the different, uh, so the input layer were the different um, settings of the simulation. And the output layer were uh, beam properties like the energy, the beam sizes, the emittances, and the energy spread, and also correlations between x and px and y and py. So what did it look like, the results? So up here you see the comparison for sigma, uh, sigma x and the emittance and the energy spread between OPA, the prediction, and in the plots below you see the difference. And you see here for the beam size, the prediction is very accurate. For the emittance, you have a few troubles here, which is inside the solenoids, but there it's not so um, relevant for when you, for example, when you want to know at the location of a screen what your emittance is, is what you're usually most interested there. The predictions are very good, you know, so for the energy spread, it's good. And the model gives a nice seamless prediction along the accelerator. Okay, so Renato also did this really nice uh, web interface for the forward model. You can actually all look at it under this link if you want. And there you can change the parameters and have a look at how this is affecting um, the beam properties along the machine. And you get a nice uh, live view of all of this. So this is really nice and this is a, a great uh, speed up in, compa in comparison to for each of these sets running a full uh, OPAL simulation. And you can even run an uh, optimization with the model and this is of course much faster. And then he also looked into invert in setting up an invertible model. So the idea is, okay, we can run 
optimization already, but could we also make an invertible model? So we can specify machine settings, uh, specify beam settings and find desired uh, machine settings for this. So their life is not as simple anymore. There are no libraries that can easily be used. You have many hyperparameters. There's quite often no unique uh, solution and the validation is also not so trivial. Um, nevertheless, uh, it works. And what actually gives is the fastest approach in the end is to use uh, this invertible model as a new starting point and then run optimization on it. So here's also an example, you also made a, a web interface for this. So you can say at a certain location, what are the desired beam parameters and then um, find machine conditions. And so basically the idea is that then the invertible model gives you a good starting point and then you can run um, the optimization on the forward model to to converge really fast. And if you would do this uh, conventionally with Opal, this would be really time consuming, of course. So here, this is a good example for how, how these surrogate models can really uh, speed up life. <laughs> Especially when you're in a trying around the uh, phase. So if you're interested in, in surrogate models, uh, there's currently a call for Marie Curie postdoc positions and PSI is in this and you can contact uh, Andreas or, or John directly about it. So then before coming all the way to the end, a couple of words about how we are handling uh, machine learning and networking at PSI. So we have these machine learning luncheons about every six weeks over lunch uh, with the free sandwiches now. Currently due to Corona, they are moved to Zoom, but they are really open discussions and informal presentations. So there you can go ask questions and show half finished results and all that. Then we had uh, last year, a nice machine learning awareness event, half, day, half a day event for everyone at PSI who wanted to come with invited speakers. We have a mailing list and a Slack channel the collaboration as mentioned with the ETH said, and yeah, these project grants with the Swiss Data Science Center that really gives uh, professional support for projects from data scientists. For example, yeah, data scientists could be at PSI once a week for a project. Then unfortunately, we, oh, fortunately we had a summer school planned, but now unfortunately due to Corona, we had to shift it. <laughs> and now also the hourly seminars with uh, machine learning topics. So with this, uh, I'll give you some more cartoons and open up uh, the discussion. Uh, Andreas, I think you're muted. Yeah, at least I don't hear anything. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, ah, there we go. <laughs> okay. Thank you very, very much for this uh, wonderful uh, and comprehensive uh, um, uh, discussion of the machine learning uh, efforts here at PSI.